Hello friends, let us now learn some important points about the CIN that is cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. This cervical intraepithelial neoplasia it has replaced the WHO dysplasia classification. So there are two important things. See, the cervix is made up of stratified squamous epithelium. Right? If this is the epithelium of the cervix, if there is dysplastic cells are seen in the lower one third of epithelial lining of cervix, if, if they are seen in the lower one third of epithelial lining of cervix, we call it as low grade squamous intraepithelial neoplasia according to Bethesda classification or according to CIN that is cervical intraepithelial neoplasia we call it cervical intraepithelial neoplasia 1 and according to WHO classification we call it mild dysplasia right if dysplasia is present in the lower one third of epithelium of cervix we call it as low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion cervical intraepithelial neoplasia 1 and mild dysplasia if the dysplastic cells are seen in the two third of epithelial lining of the cervix if they are present in two third of epithelial lining of cervix we call it as high grade squamous intraepithelial lesion cervical intraepithelial neoplasia type 2 or moderate dysplasia according to WHO classification then if the dysplasia is seen dysplastic cells are seen in more than two-third of epithelial lining of cervix if they are seen more than two-third of epithelial lining of cervix then you call it as high grade squamous epithelial lesion according to Bethesda and uh, cervical intraepithelial lesion type 3 according to CIN and severe dysplasia according to WHO and if there is intraepithelial, if there are dysplastic cells in the full basement membrane, full sorry, full uh, thickness. If the dysplastic cells are present in full thickness, then you call it as carcinoma in situ. Then we call it as carcinoma in situ in this carcinoma in situ the basement membrane is intact or normal then in cancer invasive cancer basement membrane is breached in invasive cancer okay so this is about cervical intraepithelial neoplasia classification so let us learn about the etiological factors predisposing the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia so these include most importantly uh, the most importantly this is due to human papilloma virus subtypes especially 16 and 18 mainly other subtypes like 31 33 35 39 45 52 56 58, 59 and 68 include are predisposed for cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. Now, if you see the one-liners associated with this, the HPV, human papilloma virus associated with carcinoma cervix most commonly occurs due to HPV 16. And if you see, this HPV-18 is the most specific type of subtype causing carcinoma cervix. This HPV-16 most commonly causes squamous cell carcinoma, whereas HPV-18 
most commonly causes adenocarcinoma these are some one liners we should remember then if you see if there is increased risk of squam uh, sorry if there is increased risk of sexually transmitted diseases obviously there is increased risk of development of carcinoma cervix so if there is sexual relationship or coitus before the age of 18 years multiple sex partners or multi parity multi parity or poor personal hygiene and poor socio economic status all these will increase the risk of uh, sexually transmitted diseases thus will increase the risk of uh, H uh, hpv infection and carcinoma cervix and cervical intraepithelial neoplasia smoking will increase the risk especially to squamous cell carcinoma immunocompressed individuals will also increase the risk women on ocps or progesterone therapy are predisposed especially to adenocarcinoma and in utero exposure of diethyl stilbestrol will also result in cervical intraepithelial neoplasia etiological features include hpv coitus less than 18 years of age more than one sex partners and multiple multi parity poor personal hygiene poor socio economic status smoking increases squamous cell carcinoma risk immunocompromised individuals ocp usage and progesterone usage increases the risk of adenocarcinoma and also intrauterine diethyl stilbestrol also increases the risk right so this is about the cin etiology now if a person has cin they will not have any symptoms definitely they will not have any symptoms this cin if you see cin1 first cin1 almost 60% will regress almost 60% will regress to normal whereas 30% will undergo progression so 30% will remain as it is that will persist as it is and at around 10% will progress to cervical intraepithelial neoplasia type 3 and only 1% will progress to invasive cancer that means if there is cin 1 ka cervical intraepithelial neoplasia one it will take some months to progress to cervical intraepithelial neoplasia two which might take some years almost 10 to 20 years to progress to carcinoma cervix so if you see cervical intraepithelial neoplasia most commonly occurs at the age group of 20 to 30 years and if you see carcinoma in situ occurs most commonly at the age of 30 to 35 years and carcinoma cervix most commonly occurs at the age of first peak is seen at 35 to 39 years and second peak is seen at 55 to 60 years this is the most common age group where cervical intraepithelial neoplasia carcinoma in situ and carcinoma cervix is seen so for screening cervical intraepithelial neoplasia we can screen it so screening of cervical intraepithelial neoplasia is done with the help of pap smear pap smear is done to screen the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia for pap smear we use a spatula which is like this called as ayers spatula is used and we also use an endo cervical brush is used which is for endo cervix so so first if this is the right cervix we will and this is the vagina this is the cervix this is the vagina 
first and foremost we will introduce the ayers spatula like this in the external part that is in the ecto cervix and we will take the sample see we will introduce the uh, ayers spatula like this and we will rotate it 360 degrees over the partio vaginalis of cervix and then this we will remove and we will prepare the first slide okay this is for mainly ecto cervix then <clears throat> we will take the cyto brush and we will let it go till the endo cervix okay this is the endo cervix so it has reached the endo cervix now with the help of this cyto brush is for endo cervix and we will prepare the second slide okay this is the first slide and this is the second slide and we will also prepare a control slide and for this control slide we take the sample from posterior fornix of vagina we take the sample from posterior fornix of vagina and then we will the fixative used in this pap spear is 95% ethyl alcohol and ether is used as fixative and the stain used here is papinaculo papinaculus stain is used in the pap smear and then now for the pap smear when do you screen when do you actually screen for pap smear pap smear is done mainly in the pre ovulatory phase it is done in the pre ovulatory phase with prior day abstinence of sex then what for whom do you screen that means what are the guidelines for screening pap smear pap smear should be started at the age of 21 years the a the the woman between 21 to 29 years you should do a pap smear every three years you should do pap smear every once in every three years for women who are between 21 to 29 years of age and then for women who are between 30 to 65 years of age pap smear or liquid based cytology can also be done every 5 years see if you do pap smear plus hpv you have to do you have you can do every 5 years but if you do only pap smear then you should do every 3 years so for women between 30 to 65 years if there is pap smear with hpv we should do we should screen every 5 years if we do only pap smear we should screen every 3 years then after the age of 65 we can stop screening if there are earlier 3 negative results if there are earlier 3 negative results in a row or 2 negative co-test results in a row then you can stop the screening after 65 years. If a woman has history of cervical cancer or if the person has history of HIV that is infected with HIV or history of diethyl stilbesterol exposure. In all these cases we should do screening annually. We should do screening annually. Especially in HP, HIV individuals, you will have to do annually for 3 years and after 3 years, you can do testing every 3 years. Once in every 3 years can also be done. So, this is how, this, these are the guidelines for uh, cervical cancer screening. So, for pap smear screening. In, by doing pap smear, I have said liquid based cytology. What is this liquid based cytology? This liquid based cytology is used nowadays. Here we have 
a glass instead of glass slide see in pap smear we take the samples and we put it on a slide glass slide right but here in liquid based cytology we generally put the um, uh, specimen in the uh, container containing a fixator here the preservative used in liquid based cytology is methanol is methanol okay so we can with the help of these these liquid the, the see we will we will have to put the specimen into this liquid based cytology jar now all the cells which are attached to this uh, to this material will get uh, diffused into the solution now we will take a part of this solution and we will examine under the microscope so that is liquid based cytology right now now we can also use hpv dna also right fine so this this is about the pap smear so in liquid based cytology this is the methanol right so this is the specimen is put in methanol then we will have to centrifuge it you will have to remember i forgot to tell you you will centrifuge it and once you centrifuge it the cells will be easy to visualize and then are uh, the centrifuged with the help of the centrifuged sample you will prepare a slide and you will visualize under the microscope that is liquid based cytology so which is better is pap smear better or liquid based cytology better so if you see pap differences between pap smear and liquid based cytology pap smear is a poor sample it is a poor sample whereas liquid based cytology you are centrifuging it that means you are doing further processing so it is good sample pap smear is adequacy is good fine and if you see sensitivity sensitivity of pap smear is 67 to 70% and sensitivity of liquid based cytology is 80% the preservative used in pap smear is 95% ethanol whereas preservative used in liquid based cytology is methanol is the preservative used in liquid based cytology right now so what are the results which you see in pap smear so before that before the results of pap smear what are the cancers which are screened by pap smear so pap smear can screen the cervical cancer it can screen the vulval cancer vaginal cancer and also endometrial cancer can be picked up by pap smear so for the interpretation of pap smear we use a method which is bethesda system is used for the interpretation of both pap smear and liquid based cytology so in the pap smear result you will see whether there is any intra epithelial malignancy is present or not will be seen and you will see the number of endometrial cells are also seen in the pap smear then if there is any inflammation inflammatory cells may be seen and if there is infection infectious organisms like trichomonas herpes simplex virus cytomegalovirus in herpes simplex cytomegalovirus we see cellular changes in pap smear pap smear can also be used to visualization of bacterial vaginosis candida organisms and actinomyces can also be seen in the pap smear and these are the infections along with that pertaining to cancers you can see epithelial cell abnormalities can be seen and also we can also see 
glandular cell abnormalities are seen epithelial cell abnormalities include we might have atypical which are ascus cells we call it as that is atypical squamous cells of unknown significance atypical squamous cells of unknown significance atypical squamous cells high grade are seen low squamous intraepithelial neoplasia high squamous intraepithelial neoplasia if there are any features of invasion or adenocarcinoma are seen in epithelial cell abnormalities if there is ascus so here if there is ascus that is atypical squamous cells of unknown significance then you should do a hpv dna testing and if this hpv dna testing is positive then we do colposcopy colposcopy is done if hpv dna testing is positive if it is negative then you should repeat at 12 months okay that is for ascus and for other other than atypical squamous cells of unknown significance all the other which is atypical squamous cells high grade low squamous intraepithelial neoplasia high grade squamous intraepithelial neoplasia advanced adenocarcinoma and invasion you will have to do colposcopy right fine next next if we see we also see presence of glandular cell abnormalities in the glandular cell abnormalities we have atypical cells we have endo cervical cells can be seen or endometrial cells glandular cells atypical cells are seen so in all these cases you will have to do colposcopy should be done so for glandular cell abnormalities either atypical cells endo cervical cells endometrial cells or glandular cells you will have to do colposcopy so these are the different uh, interpretations which you see through the pap smear and how you will treat the I mean you will go to the next step next so we have seen about the pap smear then for um, screening we also do colposcopy colposcopy is actually a direct visualization of the cervix is done with the help of colposcopy so this is an outpatient procedure quick and simple procedure done by the gynecologists this is the first step to visualize the cervix under magnification this colposcopy will magnify approximately 4 to 40 times magnification is seen so using colposcopy we can either apply the acetic acid if we apply the acetic acid to the cervix and visualize the colposcopy uh, with the help of colposcopy then we call it as visual inspection with acetic acid if we use a lugol's iodine that is if we paint the cervix with lugol's iodine and then visualize the cervix through colposcopy then we call it as visual inspection with lugol's iodine so if you apply acetic acid then in normal epithelium in the normal epithelium of cervix we have glycogen normal epithelium of cervix has glycogen which does not affect acetic acid much so this appears pink in color then glycogen does not appear does not affect acetic acid similarly in lugol's iodine normal cells will actually have glycogen this glycogen now the glycogen combines with iodine to result in blue color formation sorry not blue brown color formation this glycogen combines with iodine 
to form mahogany brown colored solution sorry mahogany brown brown color brown colored epithelium which is seen normally then if you see the abnormal or metastatic metaplastic epithelium in metaplastic epithelium the cells have increased nuclear to chromatin ratio because of increased nuclear content this leads to the clumping of proteins and clumping of uh, nuclear substances and also proteins coagulate thus causing grayish colored appearance if you see the dysplastic epithelium in the dysplastic epithelium there is again increased nuclear to chromatin ratio this nucleus contains chromatin actually chromatin is a protein so this chromatin will undergo coagulation in the presence of acetic acid and this will result in formation of white areas which are aceto white areas are seen these are seen in visual inspection of acetic acid then if you see in the lugal's iodine in the um, this plastic cells of lugal's iodine the glycogen is lost because there is no glycogen in the dysplastic cells of lugal's iodine the glycogen because there is no glycogen iodine has no friend to combine with and as a result this will uh, ha- do not produce any color so it does not produce any color that is no color even here acetic acid does not produce any color no color pink is the normal color which is seen in cervix so this is the things which you see on adding acetic acid and lugal's iodine with the help of colposcopy remember colposcopy is done in conditions where we cannot see the lesion properly okay but if the lesion is visible see if there is microscopic lesion this colposcopy is mainly done for microscopic lesion but if you have done a cervical examination and if lesion is visible just imagine you can clearly see the lesion then you do not need to do this acetic acid or lugal's iodine or colposcopy you can directly do a punch biopsy is done if the lesion is visible if the lesion is visible you will see punch biopsy right we have seen that in the colposcopy with the help of acetic acid you see these changes with the help of lugal's iodine we see brown in nor- brown color in normal epithelium and no color in dysplastic epithelium but what are the other changes which you can see or other findings which you can see on colposcopy findings on colposcopy are you will see aceto white areas very good and you will see leukoplakia may be seen in through colposcopy that is whitish thick epithelium even prior to the ep- a- a- application of acetic acid see in dysplastic epithelium after you apply acetic acid you see white colored epithelium but in even before application of aceto acetic acid if you see white thick epithelium that is leukoplakia there can be mosaicism or punctuation Mo- mo- mosaicism or punctuation are reflecting abnormal vascular pattern of surface capillaries are seen on colposcopy there can be some atypical vessels are also seen on colposcopy right so these are the screening tests once you have seen the colposcopy and you have taken the biopsy then you can do two things one uh, you can after doing the you have done colposcopy very good if you have obtained satisfactory specimen then it is fine but if uh, even after doing colposcopy if you have got unsatisfactory um 
specimen or unsatisfactory results if you have gone got if you are not able to uh, confirm it then you can do cone biopsy is done okay so we will see some important points of cone biopsy so this is the cervix now in the cone biopsy you will remove a cone of the cervix a small cone of the cervix is removed which includes the entire squamocolumna junction with the stroma glands and endocervix is removed you are removing entire squamocolumna junction with stroma glands and also the endocervix is removed and this part which you have removed it is divided into 12 to 16 segments and these are sectioned separately to see the histology right now what is important here for the exam are indications now what are the indications of cone biopsy this cone biopsy indications can be we can do it either for diagnostic purposes or we can do it for therapeutic purposes if you do it for diagnostic purposes if the limits of lesion are not visualized if the limits of lesion are not seen on colposcopy then you will have to do diagnostic laparos sorry diagnostic cone biopsy then if the squamocolumna junction is not seen on colposcopy if endocervical curettage is positive in h cell or if there is micro invasive adenocarcinoma or if there is adenocarcinoma in situ is suspected if this is suspected based on the biopsy results then we can do cone biopsy for diagnosis then for therapeutic you can do in cancer in situ especially in young females in young females with cancer in situ or cancer cervical stage in 1a1 in young females in young females cervical cancer 1a1 stage we can do this cone biopsy so these are the different um, indications of cone biopsy then how are you going to treat this cervical intraepithelial neoplasia so if you see the treatment of cervical intraepithelial neoplasia we have step wise treatment cervical intraepithelial neoplasia type 1 we will have to just observe it and how do you observe it you do hpv dna testing or pap smear is done every 6 months every 6 months you do hpv dna testing and pap smear if the two negative samples are obtained then you can do routine screening can be done then but if there is positive hpv dna or if pap smear shows asker cells that is atypical squamous cells of unknown significance or atypical squamous cells high grade where hcl cannot be ruled out in these cases you will have to do a colposcopy okay this is for cervical intraepithelial neoplasia type 1 if this cervical intraepithelial neoplasia persists for 2 years then you can do either a cryotherapy can be done or a loop electro excision procedure can be done then if there is cervical intraepithelial neoplasia type 2 you can do either a loop excision electro excision procedure or you can do cryotherapy then if there is cervical intraepithelial neoplasia type 3 then you can use loop electro excision procedure can be done if there is recurrence remember 
If there is recurrent cervical intraepithelial neoplasia type 3, then you can do hysterectomy should be done. So, this is the treatment options which are available for cervical intraepithelial neoplasia type 1, 2 and 3. So, in this we are learning about cryotherapy and loop electroexcision. So, let us learn some important points through differences of cryotherapy. So, we will write the differences of cryotherapy and okay first you will do cryotherapy and laser ablation carbon dioxide laser can also be done that we will see first so these two are actually ablative procedures we have two ablative procedures which are cryotherapy and carbon dioxide laser which is done for cervical intraepithelial neoplasia so for cryotherapy, so this cryotherapy, this will destroy the epithelium by crystallizing the intracellular water. The water which is present in the cells, these are transformed into crystals at high temp at low, very low temperature that is minus 22 degrees Celsius with either nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide. The water present in the cells is crystallized and this is called as cryotherapy. In this we destroy the tissue up to 5 millimeters depth and here first we will freeze it and then for 3 minutes and then you will thaw it for 5 minutes and then you will again freeze it for 5 minutes. This is for 3 minutes. This is called as freeze thaw cycle. So this is freeze thaw cycle. Now here if the lesion is present on ectocervix only we can do this cryotherapy. Not done on endocervix. If the lesion is present on endocervix then we do not do this cryotherapy. So here the post-op complications are most commonly it is associated with vaginal discharge or there can be cervical stenosis seen in this cryotherapy. Then if you see the carbon dioxide laser, in carbon dioxide laser this will vaporize the cells. So the epithelium, it will destroy the epithelium by vaporizing the cells and coagulation of proteins and it will destroy the cells. And now here we use high temperature that is 75 to 100 degrees Celsius temperature is used and carbon dioxide is used. Here the depth of destruction is around 7 millimeters whereas in cryotherapy 5 millimeters is the depth of in destruction. Then there is no evidence of vaginal discharge with the help of uh, carbon dioxide laser unlike the cryotherapy. Then Then we will have to learn some important points about LEAP. LEAP is loop electro excision procedure. This loop electro excision procedure here you will have a thin stainless, st stainless steel wire loop is present. Okay there is a thin stainless steel wire loop is present and you will excise the transformation zone is excised with the help of this uh, loop. This loop is passed into the cervix. If this is the cervix, this is the vagina. If this is the transformation zone, this loop is passed into the cervix and we will put it around near the transformation zone and through this loop, the electricity is passed. This electricity will cut the tissues and it will also coagulate the tissues and thus destroy the tissues which are present. This will destroy the tissue up to the depth of 10 millimeters depth. 
so this is actually the method of choice which is used for cervical intraepithelial neoplasia 2 and 3 at any age so this is about the treatment of cervical intraepithelial neoplasia so thank you guys for watching my lecture thank you